The uh, lecture did include just a skimming on the surface of alternatives. Uh, and again, because my focus was transportation, I uh, introduced the audience to some options for vehicle fuel efficiency, um, all, particularly personally owned vehicles, and there are numerous ones. I spoke about policy, and not only what are decision makers thinking and what are different professionals in different fields saying, but what are policy makers doing in response to the critical situation in oil. So I uh, speak about the CAFE standards, the corporate average fuel e efficiency in the United States, and that recently has become more stringent in the United States, but it has not been implemented in the fastest growing populations in the countries, particularly China and India, where the demand for more personally owned vehicles is increasing exponentially, but the fuel efficiency standards don't exist. So in a sense, yes, I was speaking of the alternatives. The alternatives are more fuel efficient vehicles and vehicles that do not rely on petroleum-based products at all. Um, electric vehicles, of course, use whatever the power source may be for uh, plugging in and recharging the electric vehicle. And then uh, biofuels are an alternative as well. It, fascinating to me was that the best information that I can provide in 2012 about alternatives is being provided by the oil companies themselves. So I close my lecture with a clip from Shell Oil Company and Shell's own public relations videos uh, take this situation very seriously and point the, the global community toward accepting alternatives rather than continuing to rely on petroleum-based fuels. I have carried this mission in my heart all my life. Um, I think that uh, in our early years, uh, all of us as humans feel some passionate, passion for some subject matter. And as we have opportunities unfold in our lives, uh, the different passions are a given opportunity to bloom. Uh, for example, some feel very passionately about caring for children or uh, dealing with uh, those who have uh, maybe certain illnesses. My passion early on was uh, about the environment and about um, care, creation care is what we call it today. Uh, but care for the earth and protection of the natural resources on which we rely. So as I moved into my adult life, um, I became involved in my career and in my education and becoming better educated and even more committed to taking action to protect the earth that we so depend on. So this particular uh, lecture is uh, it's just a, a step in my own lifelong learning. I have learned a lot in this subject area and want to share and hope that I can ignite that passion in others to be aware of what our footprint as humans is doing uh, to the earth, uh, to be conscious that uh, not only are we being selfish in consuming all of Earth's resources, but it's against our own self-interest to continue to deplete the resources upon which we rely. Uh, and I expect that, uh, good Lord willing, and I've given more time, that this passion will continue to be one that I carry with me for the rest of my days. Spokane, in, this, in the city of Spokane, in the urban area around Spokane, is doing, I, I'd say I'd give us maybe a, a C, maybe a C plus. Uh, we're not failing, uh, we're not excelling. But we have taken steps to be much more conscious of uh, what we're doing as, uh, as an urban community that affects our environment. For example, we remain committed to cleaning up the Spokane River because for years it was just an industrial dump. And now we are having to clean up the old messes and be responsible for preventing contamination in the future. We have provided infrastructure in the Spokane area for people to be able to take alternative transportation. Our mass transit system is an excellent system. Spokane Transit Authority has a regional system of buses, many of which are hybrid buses now. So people have an option to not take a personally owned vehicle. And we've built out our sidewalk and bicycle infrastructure as well. We still have a long way to go. 
And like many communities, not only in the United States but around the world, we are experiencing that political tension. The tension between going uh, to a, a community that is more committed to caring for nature, uh, contrasted with a, a voice that says it's not necessary, it's too expensive, and uh, you, it's, it's a pointless waste of time and money. Sometimes we, we tend to swing uh, from one extreme to the other, and that's why I give us a C. I, I think we're not fully committed, we're not uh, fully willing to make sacrifices uh, to make sure that, that our impact is moderated, but nor have we completely abandoned the environment. Uh, yes, we are pushing that boulder. And in my view, our real challenge now is one of, of communication. I think there really is no question that the environmental issues uh, is a fact-based discussion are very real. And that's why I think it's important to listen to professionals in different fields, whether they're oil industry professionals who are acknowledging that we, we have reached that point where any available oil is going to be more and more difficult and expensive to extract, or we're listening to national security professionals who are saying that as a matter of global security, uh, we need to pay attention that there is climate change and that it is affecting societies around the world and that we must wean ourselves off of oil uh, most of which is imported from countries whose leaders do not like us. Uh, so there, are, there certainly are uh, voices uh, speaking to us as a society that are credible voices making uh, good recommendations and we should listen to those. But we are in an era of communication in which there are multiple a multitude of uh, voices speaking opinions, uh, maybe uninformed opinions, often uninformed opinions, that are based on emotion uh, rather than rational thinking. And public relations firms are hired and paid significant sums to perpetuate emotional-based decision making. And now you can hear those voices exclusively because few people actually take uh, a newspaper or listen to a news broadcast that is objective and multifaceted. Many people now get their information from self-selected sources of information and go to those sources of information which they're already in their comfort zone. So I think that it takes discipline to to do research and to listen to voices that maybe aren't the ones that you would normally hear, uh, to be open to thinking that maybe someone has a good point, even if their opinion differs from ours. So communication is going to be very important in the policy arena if we're going to address these issues, uh, address them seriously because they are serious issues and not let ourselves uh, be misled into thinking that uh, spouting opinion is going to solve our problems. Yeah, I, I love what you're doing here at Whitworth University, and I think the opportunity that I was given to present a lecture here with your Great Decision Series opened my eyes to, to what you are doing here. You're providing a venue and uh, enticing students of all ages uh, from throughout the community to come and be exposed to other points of view and information. Academia demands critical thinking. So I think that the role of uh, the academy really is to inspire and require critical thinking. That in itself I think will lead students, again students of all ages, to make better decisions because their way of thinking will have been improved, their horizons will have been broadened, they'll see the world differently. So in my view, you're already engaged in that and I don't really have any advice for you except keep it up, you're doing a fantastic job. I'd like to see them gain as much knowledge as possible. I'd like to see them recognize that these are complex issues and then I, I would love to have every student feel that they have a role in some way in their own field of interest in addressing and helping solve some of these global challenges. After my lecture here, I was approached by two students. I was actually approached by several students, but two 
demonstrate how critical thinking can lead one to action. One student asked me about the opportunities to shape policy and ask if I could advise what are some of the paths to, have, to being given an opportunity to shape policy. So we discussed that for a bit. Another student challenged a perceived premise in my lecture that the free market is not working to solve these problems. And I agreed that that's an appropriate challenge to my lecture. And we discussed for a few minutes whether or not the free market is working. And his interest was in market and how do we make economies function. I was encouraged by those two conversations because that indicated to me that the students were, one, paying attention, two, being inspired to pursue uh, whatever stimulated their uh, deeper thinking in the lecture, and then they were moved to take action. So if there's any sort of a, a takeaway for, from me, it's if you are genuinely interested in the subject, let it mature inside of you to the point that you feel that you are ready to take the next step and take some action. And then when you feel inspired to take action, please do, because the world needs uh, well-educated, thoughtful uh, individuals who are ready to go out in the world and let's address these challenges head on. My daily work is not so much focused on the environment right now, although I indicated it permeates everything that I do as a, as a care for, for the earth and, and resources. I find myself, ironically, the chief executive officer of businesses that sell, guess what, gasoline. And, and I, on the same time, have the opportunity in my role as a CEO of a broad suite of different kinds of enterprises to be engaging in the Inland Northwest conversation about conversion to biofuels. So I'm both on the retailing end of selling the products that we have available today and in the, the opportunity to research and commercialize alternatives to petroleum-based products. So that is exciting to me because I feel that I'm engaged in a time in which we are making that transformation from the way we've been securing our energy for transportation for my entire life into what is going to be commonplace for my grandchildren. And that's going to be a world in which we have recognized that we can no longer depend on fossil fuels, that we've recognized that it's an exciting opportunity to move to an economy that relies on a different type of fuel and that we have really been on the forefront of a time of change, critical change that's necessary and meaningful.